Hello. My name is Rasmus Nelson. I am director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism here at the university. Welcome to Lady Margaret Hall for the Reuters Memorial Lecture in 2019. Our speaker tonight is uh, Siddharth uh, Vardarashan, whom many of you will know for his long and distinguished career in Indian journalism, uh, working for the Times of India, uh, working for the Hindu. Siddharth has also been an academic. No one is perfect. Um, <laughs> He was editor-in-chief of The Hindu from 2011 to 2013, and in some ways this really sounds like the kind of sort of build-up where you wonder, well, what did, where do you go from there? And I think Siddharth was asking himself this very question uh, after having left The Hindu, and in 2015 the answer was clear. Siddharth was amongst the three people founding a new non-profit journalism venture in India called The Wire um, that's committed to uh, journalism free from commercial and political pressures something I think many of us in this room might immediately think of as a good thing. Uh, it's also clear that there are millions of Indians who appreciate the work that Siddharth and his growing team uh, are doing. Many of you will have heard of some of the stories that they have broken, including uh, the golden touch of Amit Shah. Uh, it's also clear that there are one or two people who are not so pleased uh, with journalism that is free from commercial and political pressures, at least judging by the growing number of people and entities who have sued Siddharth uh, and his team uh, over a wide variety of different issues in uh, their coverage. And I think we will hear something about what it's like to practice investigative journalism in an environment like that. We will hear a lot tonight uh, about India specifically. I think it's also really worth highlighting that India is not only of incredible intrinsic importance, being as it is in that sort of much trotted out cliche, the world's largest democracy, something that may be a cliche, but is very important nonetheless, an incredible achievement. But it's also, I think, something that the rest of us should recognize is in some ways a media environment that may foreshadow uh, what many of us in the rest of the world have been seeing for a long time, are increasingly seeing, or may see in the future. A media environment that is uh, mobile first, a media environment uh, that is heavily dominated by uh, platforms in terms of distribution of content online, a media environment in which people are coming online in incredible numbers and at a critical pace. Since the last Indian elections in 2014, there are elections coming up later this year, an estimated quarter billion Indians have come online. And in the course of the 90 minutes or so uh, that we will uh, be here together tonight, another 18,000 or so Indians will come online for the first time. The pace of development, I think, is incredible. The environment is not only digital, and increasingly so, it's also one in that characterized by things that I think we can recognize from other parts of the world too and perhaps learn from the Indian experience. We see political populism of various sorts. We see uh, elements of political polarization. We see low trust in many institutions and many political uh, figures. And more broadly, weak institutions and considerable pressures on freedom of the media. India, uh, of course, uh, last year was ranked 138th in the world in terms of press freedom, um, and the issues uh, around that are growing uh, by the day. Now, these are problems, perhaps, but there are also, if you will, a space in which journalism matters uh, to an extraordinary degree. Is it possible to do journalism in that, in that environment? Um, Siddharth will give us his answer. I suppose sometimes uh, when I go and learn from the experience of, of people like Siddharth in India, I sometimes try to carry with me the assumptions of Western journalism or European and sometimes North American journalism. I think in particular of an observation that was made by the CEO of a continental European newspaper company that shall remain nameless on this occasion, who said at a meeting in Brussels, well, we all know you can only do proper journalism if you make at least 150 million euros a year. I, th I think that's an interesting observation. Um, and I think we can all understand where it comes from. Uh, but I think it's also as important as it is to reflect on the decline of that kind of journalism, also important to look at the examples of people who do important and inspiring journalism with fewer resources than that. So Siddharth and his team, 35 people or so, publishing to an audience in the millions in four different languages and have broken some of the most important stories of India in the last couple of years. Uh, I won't say more about your journalism or the context in which you operate. I will just welcome Siddharth and then look forward to the lecture and the panel discussion chaired by Alan Rusbridger that will follow. Siddharth, welcome to Oxford.
There's no clock here, so let me fish my, my phone out. Right. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you very much for um, the invitation to deliver this lecture today, and of course to the audience for coming here. Uh, it's um, uh, gratifying that um, there is interest in the work we do at The Wire and indeed on the state of uh, the media in India as a whole. <clears throat> and um, what I will hope to do in the next half an hour is to essentially uh, give you my perspective on... Um, Sorry. Okay. Give you, my, give you my perspective on the current state of play uh, as far as the media is concerned and, of course, what lies ahead in the uh, years to come. As if the future that I was contemplating when I first um, discussed the subject of this lecture with Erasmus a couple of months ago, as if that future was not bleak enough, um, the coverage of the aftermath of last week's deadly attack on Indian security personnel in Jammu and Kashmir by the Pakistan-based uh, terrorist group, the jaish e Mohammed, suggests in many ways what lies ahead is even worse. I don't wish to get ahead of my argument, <clears throat> but just to bring everyone here up to speed, the killing of over 40 Central Reserve Police Force personnel in a suicide car bombing has led to unprecedented and, of course, wholly understandable uh, national grief. But it has also led to shrill demands for revenge from a prime minister and government who are only too happy to revel in this shrillness as a means of avoiding questions about the failure of their Kashmir, Pakistan, and counterterrorism policies. From the vantage point of the media, of course, what should worry us is our failure to ask those questions in the first place. Just last month, speaking at a convention of the ruling Bharti Janata Party in Delhi, Defense Minister Nirmala Sitharaman said how it was thanks to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's firm and decisive leadership that uh, the government had managed to ensure that there, has been, that there had been no major terrorist attack in India uh, since 2014. The claim, of course, was false, as there have been many attacks that one would classify as major. But even when the Kashmir incident occurred on February 14th, no reporter or editor sought her response in the light of what she had just said a few weeks ago. The fact is that many editors and television anchors, in their zeal to be the news and drive the news, have shed any pretense of reporting it. Some channels have built war rooms in their studios where the pros and cons of different forms of revenge can be discussed. In primetime discussions, any voices urging a relook at the so-called military option or who question its utility are shouted down as anchors call for, quote unquote, the social ostracization of individuals who are supposedly pro-Pakistan and not standing by the nation in its moment of grief. The positions taken by the government's political opponents are subjected to minute scrutiny in order to see how they might have been responsible for the suicide bombing. Obviously, there has hardly been any analysis of what role official policies might have played in this tragedy. As the hot air from the big channels mixes with the toxic atmosphere on social media, the range of targets has also broadened. A senior politician from Punjab, Navjot Singh Sidhu, who is currently with the Congress party, was relentlessly trolled simply for saying one should not blame an entire religion or nation for the crimes of a few terrorists. Not only was he trolled, Sidhu was eventually ousted from his regular slot on a popular television show 
in the face of a relentless social media campaign where uh, demands were being raised for the boycotting of this channel if they didn't act to eject him. Other victims of this quest for revenge have fared even worse. Kashmiri students in different parts of the country have been harassed and intimidated with a major section of the media preferring to remain silent about this. Now, the jingoism of a major section of the Indian media is not new, nor indeed is it unique to India. All democracies at one time or another get swept up by the rhetoric of revenge and war. People in the United Kingdom know this only too well. But what makes the bloodlust of the Indian media especially alarming is the coming together of three broad trends that have adversely affected the independence and integrity of the news industry by allowing the government, the ruling party, and big business houses a greater than ever role in shaping and determining the agenda of the media. The first of these three trends is the increasing unviability of the existing business model as the move to digital reading habits further undermines the revenue base for all but the biggest media players. This has both increased the dependence of the media industry on advertisers and made them more vulnerable to government pressure of one kind or another. The second is the effective use of social media as a disciplining device. Whenever individual reporters or editors or even media houses stray too far away from the officially mandated line. And the third is the growing resort to legal means, sedition law, the Official Secrets Act, slap suits, defamation cases, etc., as well as extra legal means as a way of penalizing individuals and media who refuse to fall in line. To be sure, each of these factors or trends do not always operate in a seamless or linear fashion. <clears throat> the digital revolution, for example, has made large media houses vulnerable on the financial front, but it has also enabled small, scrappy players like The Wire or The Quint to come up. Similarly, the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party's so-called IT cell, the information technology cell, which is the uh, sort of army of um, uh, individuals mobilized to be active on social media on behalf of the party. Uh, this IT cell or the PR machinery deployed by a large business house like the Adani Group can achieve considerable media traction through their efforts, but so do our stories. For all their toxicity, Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp <clears throat> have allowed The Wire and other smaller media platforms to level the playing field when it comes to distribution. And hopefully that will remain the case until such time that governments succeed in exerting some form of pressure or the other in the future on these distribution channels. But these are exceptions. Whereas the rule, thanks to the way that these three factors operate, is that the media in India is becoming more monopolized, more regimented, and weak-kneed, incapable of subjecting the government and other powerful sectors of society to basic accountability. And I'd like to talk you through in some detail each of these three factors separately. Apart from the largest newspapers in each geographical territory, most newspapers in India would be completely unprofitable were it not for government advertising and other kinds of rent that they are able to collect. In the case of television, the situation is even more dire. <clears throat> the fall in print and television advertising revenues has led to a windfall 
for Google and Facebook as advertising content shifts onto the digital sphere, but not for uh, the big media companies whose content still drives the maximum readership traffic. Now, different media houses <clears throat> in India have responded to the revenue crunch in different ways. Apart from slashing news gathering costs and resorting to, I'm sorry, I messed up your screen. Okay, help. <laughs> apart, from, uh, apart from slashing news gathering expenses and, uh, ah, okay. I'm a Mac user, so this is all, <laughs> Windows machine is completely strange to me. Uh, so in response to the sort of financial pressure, the first response of you know, media houses has been to just cut back on, on news gathering expenses. And we've seen this across the board. This is not uniquely Indian. You have this around the world. Uh, but also uh, a shift is visible in India towards opinionated news content. This is particularly true of television because opinionated news content, news quote unquote, because it's not, not strictly news, is uh, cheap and easy to produce, and its gladiatorial quality <clears throat> is often helpful in attracting advertising. In addition, many media houses uh, have resorted to a number of sharp practices in order to squeeze revenue out of news as we know it. Paid news, that uniquely Indian contribution to the media industry, was born out of this process. Last year, a small website, Cobra Post, ran footage of a sting operation it conducted against a range of large and small media companies where its uh, reporter, its undercover reporter, posed as, uh, as a godman, as, a kind of, as, a, as a, some kind of religious person who, uh, you know, he would approach these media houses with a, with a proposal of spending, you know, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for so-called religious programming that would uh, you know, have political overtones and be aimed, in his own words, at uh, supporting the ruling BJP, and which would also polarize voters on a religious basis. So he was very explicit in his presentation in, in bringing this business proposal to a whole range of media outfits uh, and all of this is kind of captured on camera. Uh, so you have this guy coming, very shady character, making, making what looks like a terrible proposal if you're an ethical business company, media company. Uh, but what's surprising, or maybe not so surprising, but what's shocking certainly, is that of the two dozen or so media companies that were approached, only two uh, showed this godman the door immediately and said, look, we're not interested in discussing your proposal. Uh, in media company after media company, uh, this guy was uh, granted successive meetings. He was passed up the food chain by managers who felt that um, he should meet an editor, he should meet, uh, meet a CEO. In some cases, um, the CEO of a big media company uh, was involved in, in negotiating uh, how this uh, person could even pay cash instead of writing a check for, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for this... Uh, for this material, and uh, you know, this this expose basically lasted about a day. Uh, apart from us and a couple of other websites, nobody bothered to report it. And even though many of the media companies that were stung made very brave noises about filing court cases, and uh, one or two of them claimed that we actually we were doing a reverse sting on this uh, reporter, <laughs> but it's been a year now, and there's been no information or evidence of any kind. That, uh, uh, that these media companies were, um, uh, were really onto him and, and you know, planning or, or, or are going ahead with the court case. So, uh, and, and that was, a, you know, I, I picked that because it's a classic, it's a classic example of uh, the, how widespread paid news. I mean, this shows you not just paid news. In other words, somebody coming, offering money and, you know, negotiating column inches and time on television. Uh, as part of news for his agenda. And media companies knowing well that this agenda is divisive, has the potential even to cause violence, uh, are nevertheless willing to embrace it. 
And uh, in many ways, this uh, goes to the heart of exactly how rotten uh, uh, current business practices in many media organizations uh, has become. Uh, now, governments come into the picture, and the reason this uh, is not just uh, a malaise in and of itself is because governments uh, you know, come into the picture because there's always a threat of regulation of paid news, cross-media holdings, uh, which media companies fiercely resist. Uh, then many news organizations have taken to organizing large events where the presence of top ministers or even the prime minister can be leveraged to millions of rupees worth of corporate sponsorship. Some media houses have business interests running across other industries. One prominent newspaper wants to diversify into education, where I am reliably told the return on investment is much smarter than in the media. But for that, they want cheap land, uh, which means knocking on the door of a minister uh, and essentially currying favor with the government because only governments have the power to al allocate uh, land on the cheap. All of this naturally uh, generates points of pressure for political parties, for governments, for ministers to keep the media on the straight and narrow. And looking into my crystal ball, I see more and more of this happening in the years ahead, further weakening the editorial integrity of the Indian media. It is not a coincidence that we have a prime minister who does not believe in holding press conferences or answering unscripted interviews. Normally, politicians seek access to the media, even if this access means not being fully in control of the messaging or the narrative that emerges. In the case of Mr. Modi, however, he has been able to use Twitter as a communication force, communications force multiplier for his messaging. And this brings me to the second factor, which is defining the contours of what lies ahead for journalism in India, which is social media. Last week, the Times of India, which is the country's largest and most profitable newspaper, issued an extraordinary apology in its columns and on Twitter, and I quote, many of our readers have expressed concern over the headline, and it quotes the headline now, government blames Pakistan after local youth rams CRPF convoy with IED packed SUV in the worst ever JNK terrorist strike. Now, of course, if you ignore the Indian media's love for abbreviations <laughs> uh, and, and focus on the headline itself, uh, uh, essentially, the newspaper, going by the kind of noise that this headline generated on Twitter, uh, the, the newspaper was essentially guilty in the eyes of its detractors of referring to the person who caused the suicide bombing as a local youth. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, when I read several dozen complaints online against the Times of India, uh, you had irate readers saying, why didn't you call him a terrorist? Why have you called him a local youth? Whereas the headline clearly refers to this as worst, the worst ever JNK terror strike. So there is no ambiguity about what this attack is all about. Uh, but the, the newspaper goes on to say, uh, so the, 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 in, its, in its apology, the Times of India says that the headline clearly said it was a terror strike. There is nevertheless, and I'm quoting from their apology, there is nevertheless a feeling that the headline conveyed an impression of Pakistan being unfairly blamed. While fully appreciating these sentiments, we wish to point out that our entire coverage was unambiguous in stating that the terrorist was a member of Pakistan-based and controlled jaish e mohammed In fact, there is a detailed report on Pakistan's intelligence agency increasingly using Jaish as its sword arm to organize terror attacks in India. And they end with this line, Times of India condemns terror and grieves for the families of those martyred in Thursday's attack. Now, reading this abject apology, you would, you would imagine that the newspaper committed some terrible sin with this headline, but as I said, its headline is essentially factual. And uh, what apparently outraged people on social media was this failure in the headline to refer to the perpetrator, not as a terrorist, but as, I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, the failure to refer to him uh, as a terrorist and instead to go with the descriptor local youth, a fact that is absolutely germane to the story, yet the Times of India was forced to grovel. 
Now, this is the case with the largest uh, newspaper, uh, the most profitable newspaper, uh, in a situation where journalistically, it, you know, by, by, by any reasonable yardstick, uh, there is nothing wrong with this headline. Uh, I mean, I can find other subbing problems with it, but in terms of the content, <laughs> in terms of the content, you know, it's, it's certainly nothing that uh, warranted this kind of an apology. And uh, I, I mentioned this uh, in this lecture essentially to illustrate the uh, very complex relationship that has now emerged uh, between social media and the media. Uh, in my view, social media feedback serves uh, a very useful purpose, at least theoretically, in enabling a real-time two-way conversation between editors and their readers. Uh, you know, Twitter, for example, helps us realize mistakes of fact, errors of, uh, of all sorts, and to have them corrected quickly. But when it takes, when this interaction takes the form of politically influenced mass mobilization and campaigning, the consequences for media freedom can be quite deadly. Unpopular opinions and perspectives can and are squeezed out. Looking to the future, how the media, Indian media negotiates its way around the democratic promise that social media carries while avoiding its obvious pitfalls will in large measure determine its future evolution. In my view, media editors driven largely by the camera of advertising dollars are already way too dependent on social media trends when it comes to organizing their news priorities. It's not uncommon in, in newsrooms to have news editors actually literally look at Twitter trends and uh, demand frantically from journalists uh, why they haven't produced stories that fit these trends, even though these trends uh, by themselves are, are not something that you could validate in terms of a journalistic priority. Let me now turn to the third factor shaping the future of the media in India. The wire will soon be four years old. Our annual budget is around rupees seven crore or approximately $1 million. But we are facing a dozen defamation cases from some of India's most powerful businessmen in which they are seeking 11,450 crore rupees or approximately one and a half billion dollars worth of damages. Read the list. It's a who's who of the government's backers. Gautam Adani, Anil Ambani, Subhash Chandra of Z Television, Rajiv Chandrasekhar of Republic TV, and also a member of parliament for the government. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, a godman who, who supports the government. And of course, uh, the case that, uh, or the story that Rasmus referred to, uh, we have a uh, famous lawsuit by the BJP president, Amit Shah's son, Jay Amit Shah, for a story that we did two years ago. In addition to uh, civil defamation cases where financial damages are sought, India is one of the few democracies to still have criminal defamation on its statute books. And we, uh, apart from these 11 or 12 uh, civil cases, are also being prosecuted uh, under criminal defamation in four or five of these, four or five of these cases. Typically for the same story, uh, the plaintiff will file civil and criminal charges uh, to ensure maximum harassment of, uh, of the person that you're acting against. Now, the wire isn't alone in being uh, slapped in this way, to use the acronym for strategic lawsuits against public participation. The uh, TV channel NDTV has a case, a big case, as does a small website called The Citizen and Caravan, which is another magazine doing great work. Uh, and there are, of course, many others. All of these cases are frivolous, but they are filed not to be seriously contested, but to embroil the media in endless litigation that they can ill afford and are poorly equipped to handle. When I was the editor of The Hindu, I had two defamation cases filed against me by the then Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. And I'm reliably told that even though she's no more, those cases apparently will linger on. However, I never had to waste time as editor briefing lawyers or reading their long briefs. Uh, I just signed the papers brought to me by the legal department. If you are a small organization, as The Wire is now, uh, you can't afford that luxury. 
especially when pressure of various kinds is also being exerted on those who donate money uh, to the wire. Uh, and since we are a not-for-profit, donations are a big part of our, of our uh, revenue, uh, revenue model. Uh, in at least two recent cases, in which the promoters of um, NDTV and Quint were targeted, law enforcement officials turned up in pursuit of obscure cases and attempted to harass and intimidate the two news organizations. These are tactics that we have seen before and are aimed at signaling to the whole media that this too, this kind of uh, intimidation and harassment using the income tax people or other government agencies is also very much an option. In the state of Manipur in India's Northeast, a journalist has been sent to prison for a year under an administrative order for using harsh language, or rather rude language, in a Facebook video that was critical of the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister. This kind of legal and extra-legal overkill has also been used across the country to arrest and intimidate ordinary citizen critics. Individuals who would otherwise be celebrated as citizen journalists, perhaps, who use social media to voice sharply critical or satirical views against the ruling establishment. To give you an example, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, a year and a half ago, shortly after a new chief minister was elected, uh, this is a chief minister uh, against whom several criminal cases were pending for, uh, you know, for inflammatory, for hate speech, essentially. And uh, as soon as he became chief minister, he made an announcement that now that I'm chief minister, uh, all criminals will have to leave the state. I'm, I'm going to be so tough on law and order. <laughs> so this one kid, this young kid, 16-year-old guy, 17-year-old guy, uh, put up a Facebook status message saying that this is what the chief minister says, that all criminals will have to leave the state. I suppose he will have to go too. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the police essentially filed a, a whole battery of charges against this kid, uh, including sedition, including um, uh, violations of the Information Technology Act. You know, we have this horrible law called the Information Technology Act, which in some ways criminalizes speech that would not be considered problematic were it to be expressed in print or on television or in a meeting. But because electronic means are used to disseminate this information, uh, somehow this uh, becomes uh, sanctionable. And so sections of the Information Technology Act were slapped against this guy. It took him several months to get bail. Uh, I'm not even sure if the charges have been dropped, even though he's currently out. But this is just one example. And in virtually every state, you have many such cases of kids, people being targeted for a Facebook post, or in some cases for liking somebody else's Facebook post, or for putting up a Twitter message that uh, annoys somebody who has some clout with the police or with the government. Uh, at the same time, pro-establishment social media commentary, uh, no matter how inflammatory, is, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, th 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 those kinds of comments never attract uh, the sanction of the law. N n uh, attempts are never made by the police to track down who these people are who are spreading these messages. A couple of years ago, a video went viral uh, on uh, Facebook and WhatsApp of, uh, it showed uh, one, one guy, um, well, the description was, of this video was, watch how a Muslim is brutally killing a Hindu in Bihar. And the clip was of this guy wearing a cap, Islamic cap, uh, basically killing somebody on the road. And it turned out after this video was investigated that it was a clip of a fight between two political activists in Bangladesh uh, it had nothing to do with India, it had nothing to do with Hindu-Muslim, but it was being circulated by people associated with the, 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 the ruling party. But no, in, in cases such as this, which is clearly uh, something that falls foul of India's hate speech laws, uh, action is never taken. But instead, uh, stuff that is critical of the government typically tends to uh, attract the attention of the police. And of course, relief from, from the courts <laughs> takes time and can be uh, a bit of a, a bit of a crapshoot, a bit of a gamble. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually higher courts uh, tend to be quite 
strict about enforcing the rule of law, but uh, by the time you get there, you've spent a long period of time either uh, being prosecuted or in being incarcerated or whatever. So what lies ahead? And I want to now come back to the issue on which I began this lecture and, and essentially draw some concluding threads. It seems to me that we are entering a very dangerous period for freedom of speech and expression in India and consequently for the media too. One powerful and influential section of the media has already crossed over to the dark side and is actually complicit in the ruling establishment's view that there is too much freedom. The government, in fits and starts, has been talking about the need for greater regulation of the digital sphere. Ministers promote the myth that digital media is legally unconstrained, uh, unlike print and television, uh, a claim that is belied first and foremost by The Wire's own experience. So if the political trends of the last four and a half years continue, I would expect greater pressure on the legal front, on independent media, of course couched in the name of combating fake news, which is the, uh, the cover or the alibi that governments adopt when they want to act against coverage that they don't approve of. Sadly, extra legal pressure on independent media will also likely increase. It is not uncommon for individual reporters and writers to be subject to death threats. Women with strong opinions are especially targeted on social media. Gauri Lankesh, a courageous editor in Karnataka, was assassinated two years ago for her views by a fanatical Hindu chauvinist group that has drawn up a hit list of others too. Jingoism, war hysteria, and phony terror threats to national security will also, have also been used to further clamp down on dissent. Ridiculous cases based on the flimsiest of evidence have been launched to go after prominent lawyers and academics like Sudha Bharadwaj and Anand Teltumbade. Make no mistake, if the establishment is able to get away with this, next in their crosshairs will be journalists and media organizations. I would like to end on a final point. Journalists and the media can and should fight the good fight to uphold democracy, but they can only be effective if the wider institutional ecosystem has integrity and respects the rule of law. Structurally, the media in the United States suffers from many of the same ills as uh, the mainstream media in India does. But Trump is still subjected to greater pressure and scrutiny than Narendra Modi is. One reason for this is that the checks and balances on the exercise of vindictive power by the executive seem to work far better in the United States than they do in India. Given the systematic manner in which one institution after the other has been undermined in India over the past five years, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Reserve Bank of India, the Election Commission, the Comptroller and Auditor General, the University Grants Commission, even the judiciary, I can go on and on. Given this trend, it is possible that the system of checks and balances in India, so central to the preservation of democracy and liberty, but also media freedom, will see further erosion. In all this gloom and doom, it is hard to think of what silver lining the media in India can look forward to as it contemplates the future. Yet, we must soldier on in the hope that the reader, viewer, citizen loves her democratic rights more than anything else and will recognize that unless the media is able to do its job independently, it'll be good night and good luck for democracy too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Siddharth. That was absolutely um, fascinating, if slightly depressing, <laughs> lecture. But, but um, uh, I don't think we were expecting expecting you to come and be tremendously cheerful tonight. But um, thank thank you for that. And and to discuss it, we've got Martin Barron, the editor of the Washington Post, and Rita Kapoor from the Quint, 
which um, I asked Rasmus for a one-line summary that you'll probably hate. And he said, well, if all else fails, you could describe it as the BuzzFeed of India. But do you, do you hate that? Uh, <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, she hates it, okay. <laughs> Forget that I said that. But, um, uh, it gives... The new BuzzFeed. The new BuzzFeed, of, yeah, the, the nice, nice, nice BuzzFeed. Um, Unbuzzfeed. The unbuzzfeed of India. Okay, well, glad we sorted that one out. Um, um, you, you said you ended up saying it's difficult to find a, a silver lining, um, and uh, I think we'd probably all agree, uh, having heard you speak. I mean, you, you hinted at this, but, but really, a lot of the problems predate Modi, don't they? That, 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 that I guess what you're saying is that in the Indian media had got itself into a poor state already, ethically and financially, and in its dependence on certain business models, uh, and therefore was in a vulnerable position, and Modi came along and made that worse. Quite right. I think... Uh, in a sense, the, the media's got itself to blame. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are long-term trends, and uh, particularly on the, uh, on the business model side. Um, you know, we've discussed this earlier, but something so simple and elementary as... Um, you know, of excessive dependence on advertising revenue. To the, you know, so you have most newspapers, for example, are operating in a situation where 90% or 95% of their revenue comes, not from re comes from advertising rather than reader subscriptions, which is completely absurd. And, uh, and, and now that we are moving to uh, digital, newspapers are confronting the fact that they don't, they've never had a paywall in print, let alone a pay, uh, you know, how do you then begin to think about a paywall for online? So, so as sources of revenue dry up, uh, you know, newspapers are scrambling to... Uh, so, so it began with just giving more and more space to advertisers, listening to them and their concerns much more. Uh, and when finally, you know, advertising also began to migrate, uh, then coming up with all kinds of dodgy schemes, all kinds of dodgy coverage, where oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you, you'd have a composite package struck, where a newspaper would say, fine, you buy a certain amount of advertising, and in exchange, you know, there'll be five or six stories as well, uh, and maybe uh, uh, you know, other kinds of coverage against rivals. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And uh, it's very hard to, I mean, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that those of us who've worked in these organizations uh, you know, have, uh, but obviously none of this is, is, is recorded. Uh, so yeah, the ethical issue has been, has, been, you know, has, has been there for some time, but all of that has become much worse. Uh, and um, you know, and you know, governments have been governments have never been friendly to the media in the past. But I think we have a situation today where uh, this government is perhaps least uh, uh, well disposed towards free media. Uh, you know, compared to its its last three or four predecessors. Rito, how much did you agree with? That's it. Our talk tonight, and, and was he being too cheerful, or? or, <laughs> or I can just say I predicted this earlier in the yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Um, now I think I think completely, uh, one hundred percent in agreement with everything that Siddharth has raised this evening. I think to the point uh, of you know this, the malaise having been around earlier. I think that's true, but a few more things have happened since Modi has come into power. One is the gaming of social media, and therefore the pressure that comes. I think that that that, that is imposed, or the regimenting that uh, Siddharth referred to. I think that wasn't there. I think this um, the binary of if you're of na of being nationalistic or anti-nationalistic. I think this this completely. Um, if you were to take like the example from the Times of India headline that Siddharth gave. Um, you have to be nationalistic. If you aren't, then you are anti-nationalistic, and, and therefore the focus is on sentiment um, and rabble-rousing and not on fact and journalism at all. I mean, that, that, that wasn't there to this extent um, uh, in the, uh, with the previous governments. Uh, and, then, and I think the paid news and the, therefore the, the threat perception of, um, you know, for, for print, for instance, of government advertising drying up is much larger, therefore, because there is, it's not, it's no longer, uh, earlier, the, the arguments were no more nuanced. Even if it was paid news, at least there was an attempt to disguise it, which may, in some ways, be more dangerous. But now it's completely blatant. Now it's... Um, Either you're with the government or you're... Uh, there is absolutely no space for criticism because 
critical journalism is seen as hate or agenda driven. Uh, I don't think that was the case uh, earlier. Marty, we heard about a country which has demanding a great deal of patriotism from, from its citizens, um, uh, a, a country with more polarization, a country in which the media have failing business models, a country in which the leader tries to delegitimize journalism. Do you see any parallels here? <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were gonna, I had a feeling you were gonna ask me that. Um, I, um, yeah, there's some, par is, is this working? Uh, there are some parallels, but uh, we're not, at that stage uh, yet, and I hope we... Uh, we're not at that stage yet, and I, and I hope we don't end up there. Uh, certainly, I think uh, the president has... Uh, the only media that he favors is the media that favors him, uh, even though, uh, obviously, our Constitution calls for freedom of expression. Uh, um, it's interesting that just the other night, Saturday Night Live, hugely popular comedy show, uh, mocked him, uh, and he tweeted out that there should be retribution and this sort of thing should be looked into. Uh, this is satire. Uh, it is free expression. Uh, it's the kind of thing that we've accepted in our country for a long time, and yet you have a president of the United States suggesting that there should be retribution against this and some sort of um, unspecified kind of investigation into that sort of thing. So um, our, our media environment's becoming far more polarized than it ever was before. Uh, there's no question. Uh, we're being uh, hounded uh, by people on social media as well. Uh, we have had to increase uh, security for any number of our, our journalists. We had to start that during the presidential campaign in 2016, uh, and that has continued. Uh, and that's concerning, and we're uncertain where that's going to lead. I don't think we're anywhere close to where India is. Uh, my concern is that we, I just don't want us to start going down that path. But I mean, we, we all saw that tweet demanding retribution, but, but is that something that actually worries people? Do you think that's five years down the, the line we might be there, or do you think America feels confident enough in its legal and I think, constitutional? Uh, yeah, you know, what I, I think the president's goal is basically to, um, certainly with his base, with his supporters, is to essentially disqualify uh, the outlets that are not in his camp, um, they're not necessarily opposed to him, but they're not in his camp, not 100% in his camp, to disqualify them as arbiters of fact. Um, and um, that he wants himself to be the only arbiter of fact, uh, and uh, he wants media outlets to essentially be a megaphone for uh, his, his uh, account of events, uh, his assertion of facts, which many instances are not actual facts. Uh, and he wants to disqualify the press as an independent arbiter of fact. Uh, and it's a little bit of a different, I think a little bit of a different game than what's happening in India, uh, is that he just simply would like us to be ignored, to be dismissed, so that if we publish anything that is contrary to his account, uh, to his version, uh, to his policies, then uh, it's, it's simply dismissed, it's not taken, it's not taken seriously. So now, to what extent do you think there is a, a Trump playbook that Modi has learned from or feels encouraged by? If, if Trump can get away with that, then yeah. I can. Or do you think he would that he would have done this anyway? So, so the two playbooks are quite different. Uh, I would say that uh, word for, word for word, uh, Trump is far more vicious in what he says about the media than Mr. Modi. Modi is very Modi is very careful about his public utterances. So, uh, in fact, Modi, if, if Trump, is, Trump wants retribution for satire, uh, I believe there's a quote from Modi like about a, a year ago saying, I want people to make fun of me. You know, there's no harm if they crack a joke, right? But, so, so, the, so the public messaging is very different. But the way in which the systems of the two countries react is also 180 degrees against each, uh, opposite, right? So in the US, the president is vicious and hostile, but the system keeps him on the straight and narrow, as it were, right? So it's not easy for him, to, for retribution to be visited on a critic. In India, the prime minister says, ah, say what you want, you know? I, I encourage healthy criticism. But uh, you engage in healthy criticism and you find the cases filed or you, you know. So it's this disconnect that I, that, and I would much prefer 
the American the American model where the guy says yeah, what he wants. We love John. One has more bark than bite, and the other one has more bite than bark. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it's obviously preferable to have more bark than bite. Exactly, and, and essentially, you know, uh, uh, but, but the similarities would be, I suppose, the huge troll armies that both these leaders command. So there is, uh, uh, and, and perhaps in some ways in America, uh, the, you know, the, uh, they've, they've moved on from online threats to physical threats in, in ways that haven't fully happened in India yet, although we're getting there. Uh, uh, so I think that there are similarities, but uh, it's, it's this difference. You know, uh, Modi is careful about his, about his messaging. And another difference is that Trump, even though he's abusive vis-a-vis -vis the press, has his press conferences, right? And so, so, and you have some fireworks that's there, you know, people, people ask questions and there was that, uh, you know, the, the whole thing with the Costa. Uh, Modi never puts himself in that position. I think the last time he was in anything resembling a press conference was when he, when he came to England in 2015. And there were two questions at, on Downing Street and the second question was somebody from The Guardian asking you about 2002 and he didn't like that. And literally since then, uh, all his uh, press opportunities have been scripted. So you know, you, he, he gives interviews to a select few, and the rules clearly appear to be no follower questions. So uh, it's, it's quite different. Trump doesn't have many press conferences, does he? He, do, he doesn't have many, but he does use them as part of a show. Uh, I mean, he loves to, look, I mean, he, he performs best when he has an enemy. Uh, and it's why he keeps bringing up Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. Um, when he's short of an enemy, he always has us. Um, we're available all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, and uh, when he doesn't have anybody else, he's happy to take advantage of us. And the press conferences serve his purposes, his purpose in portraying us as an enemy, uh, in mocking us, uh, and uh, not actually necessarily answering the questions, right. uh, and not always answering them factually. I was listening to Siddharth and thinking, and, and you slightly made this point yourself, Siddharth, but, but actually this is a great opportunity for new players to come along and say, well, there's this corrupt old order, and we're completely different, and um, you, you, there's one world in which huge audiences ought to be flooding to you because you're the only people that can be trusted. Well, some of that is thankfully happening. Yeah. Um, you know, after The Wire did, um, very heartening to know that, after The Wire did the Amit Shah, Jai Shah story, um, there was a huge flood of contributions to The Wire uh, because they knew that there is going to be this absolutely ridiculous uh, defamation case against them. Um, so there is, so we, are, we are finding our readership is growing, The Wire's readership is growing. Um, some of the other uh, warriors like this print, Caravan, um, the readership is growing. So that's, and, 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 and you know, for instance, we, run, we have this relationship with our audiences at the Quint where we ask them to send us fake news that they, what could be fake news to share that with us and we will try and do a fact check and verify it and put it back, and, uh, and put it back pretty much on WhatsApp, et cetera, where, uh, where, the, where the fake news goes, where the misinformation goes viral. And we find that that, interaction with our readers is growing very fast and very rapidly and it's it's a they're also um, a questioning their own confirmation biases and they're having that conversation with us and they're sharing that with us and then, then they're converting that into blogs and you know putting it out so this I know that this, this is a small pocket of people but I can see that it's growing um, and you know thankfully there is uh, platforms like I never thought I'd say that, but thankfully there are the platforms like Facebook and Google, which gives us the uh, level playing field to do that. But one worries because one also hears um, how algos can be tweaked, um, and you see a you see a bit of that happening as well. So it's not all uh, perfect, but the readers are coming to us and they are engaging with us. Have we been nice about Trump, Facebook, and Google tonight? This is, this is like, <laughs> um, I'd love to hear um, from both of you. So we, 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 you've spoken very powerfully about the, the pressures on all media and, and the failings of a, a, a lot of Indian media. So how is it that the two of you are able to run organizations that are different 
uh, ethically and journalistically uh, in the face of all those pressures? Is, is, that a, is that partly down to a question of ownership? I think um, my sense is it's almost, an, almost exclusively due to that. We, we consciously uh, chose, I mean, if, if we had the resources, uh, me and my two uh, founding editors, if we had the resources to set up a, set up a regular company, the way that Quint was, we would have perhaps gone down, the, down that route, but we didn't have, and we said, let's, let's be a not-for-profit and rely on uh, philanthropy, rely on readers. And uh, this has definitely insulated us, just as in my sense is that, you know, uh, um, Quint, because it's owned by the people who run it and there's no great outside investors, and, you know, so, so it, it kind of insulates you. And it's not a coincidence that, because uh, let's not forget legacy media also, right? Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, it's precisely those uh, media o uh, organizations, I would say Hindu, Indian Express, Business Standard, that uh, are sort of conventional me media houses. They don't, have, they don't have a range of other business interests. They're not, they're not overextended the way the Times of India or Hindustan Times or others are. Uh, they're narrowly focused on media. Uh, and so it's not, it's, to my mind, it's not surprising that these three names that I mentioned still hew very closely to what the mandate of a, of a proper news organization should be. So I would say that the ownership and the business model is integral to uh, the, the fact that you know, we're able to do what we do. That's, that's absolutely right. The fact that we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about uh, anything else other than uh, than basically just paying salaries and keeping the ship running. I mean, that's really what it is. And uh, I think that's, that's what helps us uh, stay independent and stay free. Um, but you know what makes me wonder sometimes is, you know, when I look at, there's, an, there's Times Now, which is um, the Times of India's news channel, um, which actually recently after the CRPF uh, Javans were killed, we, I actually heard the anchors say, that the separatists uh, who are supporting uh, Azad Kashmir, um, their security should be taken away. So we actually had a news anchor actually saying that these people should be killed. And at the same time, they have the same uh, media houses, another TV channel called Mumbai Mirror, uh, which actually says the opposite thing. So the same media house runs two um, uh, products, so to say, with completely <laughs> divergent. So there's very strange things happening in the country right now. Uh, Marty, we were talking, I mean, we know that at the moment the Washington Post and the New York Times are, are healthy and they're doing great journalism, but you were speaking earlier about the crisis in local journalism. Can you talk a bit more about that and whether those papers are going to be more susceptible to the kinds of pressures that Siddharth was talking about earlier? Yeah, well, I think certainly in the United States, uh, the news organizations that are doing the best are the ones that can play at a national level, and even an international level, like The Times, like The Post, uh, and some others as well, mag certain magazines, The New Yorker, for example, um, and The Wall Street Journal, and, and news organizations like that. Real crisis in American journalism is at the local level. Uh, no one has come up with a real model yet uh, for, uh, for local journalism that can be replicated around the country. Maybe there are a few examples that, are, that show some promise, but that's, uh, that's about it. And I think it does make them susceptible to, to pressures. I mean, fortunately, many of them are owned by news organizations with a long history and a tradition uh, that, um, uh, where they would, resist that kind of, they would resist that kind of pressure and would not be susceptible to that. Uh, including the places where I've worked, uh, which was the Miami Herald in Florida, uh, the Los Angeles Times in, in California, the Boston Globe in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't think any of them would be susceptible to those kinds of pressures. Uh, but uh, I think that it, it could happen at other places and probably has happened at other places. And, um, and so I think that's a matter of concern. The bigger concern is not so much the pressure, but the fact that they don't they don't actually have any reporters to cover government officials and um, to cover the police, to cover the school boards, to cover their local environment, to cover, um, to cover the courts, to cover all of the things that they should be covering, to cover the, the uh, state government. Um, you know, in, ma in many states, the, there may be only one or two people uh, at the, in the state capital 
uh, from the largest news organization in the state. Uh, and that, that individual, or maybe two individuals, is responsible for covering the governor, both houses of the legislature, both houses of the legislature, uh, the politics, the policy, the, all the government agencies, everything like that. And the reality is that they can't cover, they, they can't do that. Uh, they certainly can't do investigations. And so government officials know that nobody is, is looking at what they're doing. Nobody is really holding them accountable. We've, um, we've got about uh, another 10 minutes or so, so I, I would be delighted to have questions from the audience. If you can, if you can um, have you got, we've got a microphone, so somebody put their hand up and grab a microphone. Yes, yeah. What, what do you do with the billions of dollars of lawsuits? I mean, how do you dispose of these? They just sit there? You, what do you do with this? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the pro, I mean, the, these are intended, the process is the punishment, right? So, so the, the, uh, very often they file and they, the, the person who files them doesn't actively pursue them either, but they remain on the books to be activated. Uh, so in some cases, uh, you know, our physical presence is required in a court that's quite far away from Delhi. Uh, we have we have excellent lawyers, and we are you know confident that all of these cases will be we will win all of them. And uh, I, I joked at at a, at a at a at a gathering in Delhi last month that uh, I would love love for the Supreme Court to say that uh, if somebody files a case of this kind, they should be prepared to surrender one percent of claim damages in the event of loss, uh, uh, and and you know, we, that that would take care of the corpus uh, that the wire is trying to build forever and ever. Amen. So it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it basically takes up, it, it takes up time and space, um, time that we, you know, we would spend on journalism, gets, you know, uh, you have to review things, uh, but it's not, a, it's not as if it's, it's life-threatening or business-threatening, it just, it's just a harassment. But I, but I also think that there's legal fees to worry about, which is, uh, which can be quite crippling and which is, again, resources which then get diverted from, uh, uh, journalism, yeah. and I think that is one of the intentions. The intentions is to uh, to do that. I mean, I've I've overheard to um, to um, Pranoy and Raghav have this conversation to say they were comparing notes on whose IT slash ED raid was more dehumanizing. You know, <laughs> they came to my office. They came to my office. They came to my house. They were in my house for 24 hours. I mean, so that's where the conversation is going. And so you you're spending. Time, money, effort, it's, right. it's, and that's the, the intention is, thankfully what is not happening uh, is, uh, I don't think they're being effective in trying to delegitimize, uh, uh, which is also one of the intentions. I don't think that has happened, and, and thank God for that. Another, yes, two sort of questions near each other there. Take the gentleman first. I, I do think it's very gloomy, um, and I, I think you were right to point out that it, while the media might be in the front line, it, it's a whole range of institutions, academe, um, judiciary, and so on, that are coming uh, under pressure. I, I, um, I mean, picking up the, uh, the, the question that Alan asked, in terms of trends, do you think, do you have any hope that um, were the uh, opposition to win, things might get easier? It and does doesn't... look as if Modi will probably win on current uh, yeah, estimates, I, but I mean, do it's... you have any hope about, about changes? No, I don't doubt that uh, a lot of the pressure will get relieved, but a lot of this stuff lingers on and, you know, the, you know uh, I haven't spoken about, uh, you know, the co communalization of the public sphere that has happened. You see a lot of uh, 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 r religious bigotry that has been spread uh, all of that stuff lingers in the atmosphere and takes years to go away. Uh, and I think that the functioning of some of these, you know, I think what the government has done to the Central Bureau of Investigation, what it's done to the Reserve Bank of India, uh, these are all models that future governments will follow. So once a bad precedent has been set, uh, it becomes easy for other governments. So there would be, I, I would imagine, momentary relief were there to be a change of government. But uh, unless something fundamental is done by way of uh, institutional reform, uh, these bad practices will probably resurface again and again. Next question here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for your words today. Um, I was curious if you could speak a bit to the pros and cons of incorporating outside of the country as a sort of measure of you know, protection against the type of legal har harassment that you describe. Yeah. It, it doesn't, I think incorporating outside doesn't protect uh, you from legal uh, harassment because uh, essentially, you know, you're liable for wherever you operate, right? So, uh, so I would imagine that even if the wire were to be set up in London, but if you're disseminating information that is deemed to be defamatory, quote unquote, so-called, uh, in Ahmedabad, then somebody will, can and will file a case. So I don't think that that uh, necessarily protects you. And I would say, you know, the laws in India are so, uh, I mean, there's so much of suspicion of the foreigner, right? It's, it's ironic, right? The same government that, you know, is very happy to court FDI in all kinds of fields, including defense and so on, and strike all kinds of deals, but when it comes to uh, the media, is, is, is completely paranoid and, and, and spreads this kind of idea that, so, so if, if somebody, if, if a news organization were to be registered abroad and be functioning in India, I'm sure that would be, that would make them a target for attack. So- It'd be anti-national to begin with. Yeah, exactly, anti-national. <laughs> yes, question there. Start my question for you. Another five years of Modi and weakening of institutions. So where does that take India? And where does it take the region? Because next, your next door neighbor has a similar pattern. Um, is it going to be death of journalism? Or a new kind of journalism will then get created? See, the, the, the silver lining that I didn't talk about, but you know, the fact is that one of the benefits of the digital era is that you can't kill journalism now, right? You can't kill a story. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the information will come out and it will, you know, it will find its level. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't worry about, and even if some of these lawsuits, you know, even if financially we get crippled, uh, it's, you know, very, it's not difficult to revert to a, a completely stripped down, low cost version and just come out, right? Uh, so, I, you know, but I, I worry about um, what, is being done to the uh, integrity of a whole range of institutions. For example, the university system. The, you know, the way in which uh, the autonomy of universities uh, is being ridden roughshod over. Uh, I worry about what they've done to the bureaucracy. I worry about, you know, you name it. And, and you know, these are all leaving toxic imprints, uh, which will be very hard to correct or reverse uh, over a long period of time. So the, the real question is not, what happens if Modi gets another five years? But the question I think that, that you were asking that, you know, that even if Modi were to be defeated, how easily can some of these things be reversed? And I would say that it's not easy because uh, just on the communal issue alone, uh, so much of poison has been, you know, look at the Congress government, which was elected in, in Madhya Pradesh. Within a week of coming to power, they're slapping the same old cases on about cow slaughter, you know, invo misusing the National Security Act against people suspected of, of cow smuggling. Because that's, that's the legacy they've inherited. And they're too scared to say that's all rubbish, I'm going to abandon it, for fear of somebody accusing them of not being good Hindus, quote unquote. Right? So it's this, uh, this toxic, you know, this hyper-nationalist and this, you know, uh, the uh, uh, mixing up of religion and national identity that has happened uh, over the last four years. It channels, I mean, uh, what makes me particularly worried about the media is that big channels, she mentioned Times Now and others, I mean, big channels have become vehicles for uh, religious hate mongering today. This is new. Uh, 10 years ago, you know, maybe a small regional paper in Gujarat, you could say, has, is, is engaging in communal propaganda. But today, your biggest channels, day after day, engage in vituperative propaganda against Muslims, uh, uh, they, the way they treat Kashmiris, every Kashmiri is, is labeled as a anti-national, as a terrorist, as a, you know, so it's, uh, and, and this, is main, this is mainstream media. And, and that's what's kind of worrying when I uh, consider the long-term impact of this. We have time for probably two more questions. So one, one of the front. Sorry. Sorry, Richard Morgan from Anglo-American, just speaking as a representative of business. Um, have business changed the tune at all? Have they been the, the way of being depicted as perhaps the villains in the piece 
do they realise as a civil society benefit to be gained by um, by helping out at all? Well, you have business and you have business. So, so uh, I would say companies that are that have hitched their wag hitched the, hitched themselves to the government's you know chariot uh, are the ones who are most prickly and litigious uh, uh, and very very trigger happy when it comes to slap suits and so on and so forth. But you have a lot you know others who are uh, you know. Uh, uh, also open, you know, who, who recognize the value of having a free press and, you know, uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't paint the entire business sector with one brush, but there are some that uh, clearly don't value, uh, you know, freedom of the press. Uh, but there is a section that does. I can tell you that even there is, there is the lot that is slapping suits and is completely aligned uh, with the ruling party. But there is, we know because we are an advertised uh, revenue driven entity, that a lot of uh, business houses are choosing not to advertise with the Quint, for instance, whether it's just straightforward display ad or programmatic ad or whatever, because they just don't want to be seen to be identifying. So, they're, so, so, so it's passive, but um, it's careful. I'm happy just to start to go off on a tangent. We were talking this afternoon uh, about the sense of which the, 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 the American press has come under a, a tremendous amount of attack from certain quarters in recent years. There are some signs now that people are beginning to rally to it and appreciate it and, and come to its defense. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think that you've uh, seen that in a variety of ways that uh, certain segments of the public have come to the to the cause of, of joining sort of the cause of the of, of the press, uh, you see that in the in the rapidly growing subscriptions at places like the uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, they've escalated quite rapidly over the last several years, uh, and that's been encouraging. You also see some uh, polling data that over the last uh, couple of years, actual trust in the press uh, in the United States has actually gone up. Now, the disturbing part of that is that it's gone up dramatically among Democrats, uh, and it hasn't gone up much at all among Republicans, if, if any. Uh, but it's gone up among, uh, among independents. Uh, so uh, what you're seeing is a strong support in certain segments of, uh, among certain segments of the American public, uh, but a deepening polarization uh, in the consumption of media and in, and in levels of trust. I think there's one question. Uh, well, we've only got time for one. Well, there are two here, and there's, uh, there's two, we can have two with the microphones close to each other. So, why don't you uh, ask two questions in one, and then we'll take them together. Well, thank you. Uh, mine is pretty much related to what you were talking recently. Uh, it's been, I mean, it's it's mainly global that uh, many in these times where uh, legacy media is losing in some many places credibility, uh, they are arousing these new these new startups that uh, maybe trying to I mean, or with the idea of, of independent reporting, they are gathering lots of support. But that support, do you think it's related? to the independent media uh, speech, or it's also related to some partisanship from the people that support that media? And how do you deal with that? The expectation of the readers, what are the readers that you are uh, receiving and, and the expectations, and how do you deal with that? Not to become like a, a, a partisan media uh, in this environment, because uh, it's, it's like what would happen when this change? And, and we know in some countries like the US, it's like uh, pretty much like, a, you have this uh, changing uh, media, uh, t changing uh, governments, and how do you expect to react people wi when that happens? Okay, this one's a question about the readers, yeah. Um. It's uh, sort of related. So my question was about the role of philanthropy and whether you're positive. In fact, it relates to your previous question about the role of philanthropy in supporting independent media, given that you're registered as a not-for-profit entity and there are other publications as well. I mean, there are challenges, so if you can speak to that a okay. bit. Okay. Uh, they're both excellent questions. Um, I think uh, in response to your question, I mean, this is something that we, we need to guard against uh, because um, uh, it, it is the fact that there is an overlap between those who want and value independent media and, uh, and, and, they, and they want and value it in the context of the fact that so-called mainstream media has 
basically stopped being critical of the establishment, right? So there's a sense in which they are anti-establishment, the, these readers. So there's an overlap between the desire for independent media and their own political perspective, uh, which, uh, which poses a challenge for us. Because, and, and the only way to, to deal with that, I think, is to occasionally irritate one's readers <laughs> and, and come up with things that they say, oh, why did The Wire print that? And I say, well, tough. This is, I mean, we, we do it. You know? And so, so if, and, uh, you, you know, it's, it's if, if, they, if there's, there is a government initiative that works, I'm quite happy, and I think it's important for The Wire to report it in the way that it, in a proper way, even if that disappoints, uh, you know, others. Uh, that's the, uh, quite frankly, that's the only way that I can see around this, this problem. And also to be, to be um, you know, to, to, to keep editorial and opinion, I mean, to keep reporting and editorializing separate as far as possible, so that a, a news story uh, should not be overlaid with the opinion and perspective of the person writing it. Uh, you know, uh, of course, you, know, you give background and you have some analysis, uh, but it should not be ideological or should not be opinionated. That's another way, but this is a struggle. Uh, your question on philanthropy, um, you know, we, we've been fortunate to have the support of the, uh, this foundation in Bangalore called the Independent Public Spirited Media Foundation, uh, and also from a few other people. But I would say that there is, you know, uh, you know when, I, when I said that the media needs, I mean, independent media needs a, uh, you know, you, you need a, an institutional ecosystem uh, which respects the rule of law and which you know, functions in a democratic, transparent manner, I mean that there should not be a situation where government ministers lean on donors. Right? So, so you, it's difficult to have a, a philanthropically driven independent media if ministers are going to badger uh, uh, philanthropists and high net worth individuals saying, why did you give money to so and so? Recently, there was a there was a story in a, in one of the websites in India uh, about uh, how a number of Indian private universities are being denied uh, the label of institution of excellence by the government uh, because there is an intelligence bureau report apparently uh, of of how some of the professors and promoters of these, university, these universities uh, have been doing various things against the government. And one of the issues mentioned is that many of them have uh, supported the wire financially. And so then, the, I, don't, I don't know how accurate the story is, but, if, but if it's tr even if it's not true, the fact is it's, you know, it's likely to have a chilling effect on any, on any, any would-be donor. Because if you say, well, you know, it's... Uh, um, you know, I'm not only going to, going to uh, go after you individually, but I'm going to cripple the university you're associated with, and I'm going to you know, uh, raid your mother-in-law's tax, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be all out. If that's the perception that's created, then obviously it becomes difficult for, for philanthropists to be philanthropic. Uh, and so they, they, you know, they shouldn't be, so ideally we want a situation where a rule of law prevails and people are free to donate their money if they want to, and there shouldn't be any kind of political consequences, but sadly, that's not the case right now. I know we could carry on talking like this uh, for a long time, most evening, but, um, but we have to have a drink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is Oxford, after all, um, and after that we have to eat, so we have to get our priorities right. But um, uh, can we thank Siddharth for giving us so much to talk about, and also to Marty and Utu for coming and talking to us.